everybody, and welcome to the WiMAX Forum's uh, virtual presentation series. Uh, this is uh, number five in a long series over the uh, long, hot summer, COVID summer. Um, why are we doing these? We normally, our business uh, generally affords the ecosystem multiple opportunities over the course of the year to get together and share experiences and talk about product innovation and application development, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, with the worldwide pandemic, haven't been able to do that. And so uh, we thought this would be a, a reasonably comfortable way for the ecosystem to get together uh, in spite of the virus and uh, learn about what's been happening. And it's been really successful, um, in my view, um, and happening every two weeks. So uh, uh, as I said, this is the fifth, and uh, certainly uh, tune in two weeks after this because there will be another and another, and so uh, et cetera. So we're not running out of content, sure. And it's been, as I said, a fantastic series. We began with really the regulators and the folks that that pulled the industry together uh, more than 10 years going on now and developed Aeromax. Uh, had a fantastic set of presentations from Europe Control, Federal Aviation Administration, and the International Civil Aviation Organization. We followed that presentation by actually looking at a deployment operator. Uh, so Aviation Data Communications Corporation of China talked about their ambitious deployment, which will ultimately, in its first stage even, uh, build out 100, over 110 airports in China. They're already in over 25 or 30 in China. And, and they've got a series of applications both in the cockpit, above the surface of the airport, and fixed. Um, Ianti is our uh, cybersecurity kind of PKI partner uh, for the WiMAX Forum, uh, really ma managing the development of the specific policy, but also uh, managing provisioning and uh, distribution of PKI certificates. And Siemens, a board member of company of the WiMAX Forum, um, talked about their success uh, supporting China as well as other places and. Uh, Kind of their products and applications that they, they see as emerging important applications. We then uh, continued in our third series, the third presentation set with Digister, uh, which is the world's largest uh, issue for PPI tickets and a long time part of the WinX Forum. Uh, they talked about the importance of uh, PKI, uh, how, they're, how they're provisioning certificates and sort of their pedigree, if you will, as a CA. Uh, Lisbon Airport gave us a pretty exciting presentation on uh, their deployment, which was the first deployment in the world. Uh, it's fully commercial, and it's expanding. They're very, very happy with it. Uh, lots of different sorts of applications, which uh, makes it pretty interesting. And Tyrad is an equipment manufacturer, board member company, WiMAX Forum, long-time WiMAX, Aeromax manufacturer. And uh, Tyrad, it was very appropriate that they participated in that presentation. They're the, they're the equipment manufacturer of records. Or Lisbon, so they were pretty proud to stand alongside their partner, their operator partner, and talk about uh, what they're doing with their products. In the fourth presentation, uh, we had Avicom. We moved to Japan, and Avicom is the uh, services operator for the aviation industry. Uh, a really interesting presentation from uh, Shoichi Hanakani, who's the chief engineer there at Avicom, talking about their applications, again, both fixed and mobile. And really, the value that they see between uh, by Aeromax technologies, capabilities of supporting both fixed and mobile uh, air traffic control and operational traffic at uh, the same time. Um, Honeywell, an uh, avionics manufacturer of, that everyone would recognize, talked about, you know, and we were really pleased to have Luke Roy uh, give that presentation, talked about kind of the genesis and the rationale for Aeromax where Honeywell, how it's fitting in Honeywell's offering, portfolio of offerings, if you will. Um, and uh, you know, Honeywell, particularly in the form of Olaf Roy, has been really, since the beginning, uh, helping to develop from a technical standards and tech profile standpoint, um, Aramax technology. So we were super pleased to have Olaf give his presentation. And finally, Leonardo, uh, uh, board member company, uh, the WiMAX Forum as well, and a manufacturer with a long, long uh, category of you know, aviation, uh, air traffic control, air traffic management solutions, talked about you know, how Aeromax fits in their product 
portfolio and why they're supporting it, and sorts of applications they see interest in. So today we're moving to uh, two really fascinating companies. Uh, Shelfland uh, Technologies really cut its teeth on RF planning and just kind of spectrum optimization, if you will, for LTE, Wi-Fi, WiMAX networks. And uh, Leonard Korvaychuk, who is an author of multiple books, uh, thousand plus page books, uh, is, he will be speaking today. We're just really pleased to have him. He's, he's one of the world's leading experts, if we can comfortably say, on, on RF, radio frequency technologies, and propagation, et cetera. So, Cellplan has got a pretty fascinating presentation today on really the, ultimately the presentation highlights the value of the spectrum. It's been set aside for Aramax uh, from 5091 to 5150 uh, megahertz. So I think Leonard's presentation is going to be pretty interesting from that standpoint. We'll be followed then by Gene Crozier, who's a uh, longtime friend of Aramax technology. Uh, Gene works at PowerTech Labs, which is the only Aramax designated certification laboratory in existence. And they certify manufacturers' products, uh, kind of verifying to the market well, that products that are marketed as being Aramax compliant indeed do conform from a protocol radio interoperability standard to the standard. So Gene will be talking about, you know, how, how it happened that PowerTech uh, came to do this kind of work and sort of the paces that a manufacturer's got to go through to achieve certification. And we just had our first manufacturer, Siemens, complete certification. So that was really a milestone. And we have three or four other manufacturers in progress right now. So um, we're going to find ourselves by the end of the year probably with a stable of manufacturers, with devices and base stations delivering certified products to the market. So that's a pretty exciting uh, milestone. So the so WIMAX Forum has been around for uh, geez, almost 20 years, and we are a uh, not-for-profit industry-led consortium. We, don't, we didn't develop the Aramax uh, standard. Uh, IEEE developed the standard, uh, you know, the WIMAX uh it's a 16 standard, but we certainly were involved and, and developed the technical profiles, um, which became the Paramax. And uh, we were involved for many, many years now with, as I mentioned, the regulatory community and the technical community in, in terms of EuroK, uh, RTCA, et cetera, and the development of Aramax technology standards. Now we manage those standards. We also manage the ecosystem that builds to those standards. We also certainly market uh, Aramax technology. We do quite a bit of work on spectrum issues, and as I mentioned before, we're heavily involved in certification of products. So uh, we are truly here to help the ecosystem advance uh, Aramax technology, and uh, we do things like this, like this webinar series, trying to bring the ecosystem, you know, give opportunities for the ecosystem to come together and learn from each other. So Aramax uh, was really developed. Uh, in response to a need by the aviation community to develop, to bring a 4, 4G technology into aviation, aviation community. And uh, the aviation community has found itself part of the introduction of Aramax and associated technologies, uh, really delivering um, early, early 19th, 20th century technologies based on DHS, voice. Uh, to deliver safety critical and mission critical data services out of the cockpit across the Air Force service um, for speed and for safety and efficiency of flight. And so Aramax, as I mentioned, alongside sort of, uh, satellite technologies and LDAX, is a 4G broadband technology that brings aviation communications into the 21st century. Uh, Aramax systems operate on protective spectrum and their capacity, speed, and performance to really deliver on the promise of uh, enhanced safety and regularity of flight. And as I said, are bringing aviation communications into the 21st century. All right, so that's enough from me. Uh, it's more of a table-setting exercise. I want to really pass it to Leonard. I know Dr. Korvaychuk has got a long presentation, but it's full of uh, kind of essential information. So, Leonard, without any further ado, uh, you can unmute your line if you'd be kind enough to take it away. Okay. Well, first I would like to uh, thank you, uh, Wemers Forum, Declan, 
for this opportunity. I think it's very important to change ideas, to interchange, and these uh, seminars are very, very, very important, I think, to uh, send the message across and the importance of the solution. Uh, what I will talk today is about the full apron visibility design. Well, let's first define apron. Apron uh, is basically the area of an airport where aircraft are parked and loaded, loaded, refueled, or boarded. Uh, according to ICAO, uh, the apron excludes the maneuvering area, but uh, for the sake of this presentation, I am including the maneuvering area into this presentation also. So I would like to start with uh, my personal observation. The first time I was exposed to the apron, I, had, I was four years old, and I was amazed, you know. I still have, until today, the image of the first time I saw the apron uh, in, in the airport. It was something amazing. It was 70 years ago. Well, it didn't really change much in those 70 years. Everything that we had at that time is still the same or very similar technology. The rest of the airport evolved, but the apron of the planes evolved everything else. So, why, what was holding the, the evolution of the apron? Basically, the need for communications. So, apron has a humongous area, and uh, there were no communications there. So, uh, for the apron to benefit uh, from the technological evolution, it needs to have spectrum. And spectrum is available now. Uh, restricted, uh, reliable spectrum is available. The technology is available. So what are we waiting for? It's taking long, long time to deploy. Any, uh, there are some deployments, as, uh, as Declan said, but I believe they are very timid. And one of the reasons that they are so timid is that people didn't yet understand the benefits that we can get with a full apron visibility design. And that's what I would like to cover today. So how can we communicate, uh, uh, can we provide a full video coverage? Can we use video analytics? And how can we use this spectrum efficiently? It doesn't matter how much spectrum we have. It never will be enough, so we always have to be very efficient. Next. CNSI, what does it mean? Communications, navigation, surveillance, and identification. So those are the four areas that the apron can benefit. In communications, the controller to plane, controller to ground, and airplane to ground mainly, that's something that doesn't exist today, Direct communication between the airplane to ground, Aeromax will make it possible. So communication is essential. So it will be the connected plane for the first time on, in the, on the ground. Navigation. The pilot of a plane, I always get very, very uh, preoccupied. They don't have visibility. They, can see a very little part of the of the airport, so they need to rely on guidance from other people. Uh, what about if they had 360 degrees visibility? Okay. Uh, today the airplane needs marshals to to park. Well, I have have been stuck in planes that couldn't park because there was uh, uh, lightning going around. Well. With what we have today, uh, the video analytics, the video capability, the, the, uh, the pilot can do it easily, even without the marshal, and probably much better without the marshal. Uh, even gate control can be done from, from the plane. Surveillance. There are big issues of surveillance today uh, on the perimeter of the wildlife, 
uh, on the presence of objects. So the benefit of having a full real-time visibility of the entire airport is something very, very precious. Identification. Well, uh, April today has thousands and thousands of objects. Where are they? What are they doing there? Are they should be there or not? So the identification of those objects is very important. The real-time location, real-time people location, uh, the existence of non-identified objects or a non-authorized presence is very, very important for the security of the airport. And all of this can be done. Just we need to design it. So the first thing that we have to worry about is spectrum. How to use the spectrum? Well, finally, the, the aeronautical industry has a reserved and exclusive spectrum, Aeromax. Of course, Aeromax is a great spectrum, but it's not enough to do everything. So it has to work in conjunction with other spectrums, like the shared spectrum that is used for public safety support. It's also an exclusive spectrum that inside the airport is not used today. So why not benefit from its usage? A license spectrum, depending on the application, a license spectrum is perfect. And is the spectrum that has the major, major, major availability. And even the public carrier spectrum. So if we do an integrated design, a visibility design of the apron, we should consider all of these. We should consider the applications. And the applications, we need to divide them in categories. So real-time critical with high-impact applications should use the most noble spectrum, Aeromax. Real-time critical with significant impact can use supposed public safety. Real-time with low impact can use either public or unlicensed and so on. So we need to first list all the applications and grade them in terms of impact, in terms of requirements and so on. And we have also informative and statistical uh, that are really not critical at all, but it's good to have. Next. So what we need to do is a long-term comprehensive apron visibility plan. The worst thing that we can do is to do a simplistic approach because it's damaging. Uh, when cells started to be deployed, people would put cells on top of hills and try to cover the entire town. Well, it worked for a while, but soon it became a nuisance because there was so much interference that all those sites had to be killed. And uh, the cellular planning came from several and several and several uh, layer in design, and each time, you know, the equipment was trashed and uh, installed new one and new one and new one. So the right thing to do is to do an integrated plan for air, airline, airlines and planes. And this plan should cover at least the next 10 years. Uh, the video feed should be considered the communication should be considered. All the data storage should be considered. So it's a really a long-term comprehensive apron visibility plan. And uh, I cannot stress the importance of doing this. And uh, a lot of it can be done once and can be replicated in other, in many, many, many airports. So what are the, the benefits? Well, many benefits. We can connect hundreds of sensors across the entire apron. Airplane can have, airplanes can have connectivity to the ground network when they are on the surface, of the apron surface. They can talk to, you know, uh, loading the, the luggage. They can talk to people, uh, maintenance, and so on and so on directly. They can get uh, documents. They can get information. They can talk to uh, controllers. Uh, they can have video from the plane coming out, you know, 
and vice versa. So monitoring the entire apron and the surrounding areas can be done very efficiently because then we can apply analytics. And today analytics are extremely powerful. Asset location, that's another humongous benefit. All, each one of those items can save hours, hours, and hours uh, per day in the airport. You know, increase the efficiency. Uh, we can store uh, all this information, and then we can revise it, we can check what happened, we can correct the procedures. So the benefits are humongous. And we can have a full apron visualization with combined multi-source data. And that's really very, very important. So let's analyze uh, an airport. The airports we used to do this initial study was the Boston Logan International Airport. And here we have some pictures. And uh, we did the actual RF propagation measurements at the airport. We analyzed it uh, and so on. So before we can do a design, we need to understand what uh, is the demand. So the first demand that I would like to analyze is the video. So next slide. What are the video feed requirements and the analytics? Unfortunately, the Aeromax has a limited band of uh, 5 megahertz, uh, and uh, that limits what we can uh, transmit. So we can go up to 5 megapixels, but then the distance becomes relatively small. Uh, of course, we can benefit from uh, certain uh, compressions, but uh, here we classify the, the video according to uh, the quality of the resolution. So we can go from a strong ID to recognition, to detection, uh, identification, observation, and only monitoring. And for each one of those, we will have a certain uh, distance, a certain frames per second, and a number of megabits per second that is required. Here on the, on the left side, uh, I couldn't find a single photo of analytics in an apron. But it's obvious that we can do it, and we can do it very, very precisely. The analytic technology today is unbelievable. So it's possible to, uh, as we see in this picture, identify even the brand of a car. We can identify, uh, you know, any object that is in the in the apron and also the ones that should not be there. We can use uh, RFID to identify uh, the the code of the of the object and so on. So there is a lot of things that we can do. I will not bother you with all the details of this table, but this is something that when we do the design, we have to consider. So the different resolutions and each location of the airport of the apron requires a different resolution. It requires a design. So every single gate, every single, and these uh, designs can then be reused for other airports. But it needs to be done very, very detailed. Uh, seriously in, in details. Do we want recognition? Do we want observation? Do we want detection? Do we want monitoring? So all of this uh, will give us what is the range, what is the uh, megabits per second that we need, and so on and so on. Next, please. Let's speak a little bit about spectrum. Here in the middle of this table, we have the three Aeromax bands. Uh, the 5091 to 5150 is the main Aeromax band, but the other two bands can also be used sometimes uh, in uh, certain countries. Uh, there are some limits, but theoretically it's a lot of spectrum. We have at least uh, 60 megahertz, maybe 150 megahertz, depending on the location of the airport and so on, and the local regulations. But beside this, we have other uh, spectrum available. Of course, the Aeromax spectrum is the one that will go to the applications that are most, most critical. 
that really require a segregated spectrum. But then we can use, you know, the 802.11t, we can use, that is for transportation. We can use uh, the uh, 802.11j, that is for public safety. And we can use the unlicensed spectrum for applications that don't require, that are not critical. Remember that uh, the FCC just giving, you know, uh, more than one gigabit, uh, giga, uh, gigahertz uh, for unlicensed spectrum. And then, of course, we have the high frequency spectrums and by gig and so on and so on. So a comprehensive design should consider all kinds of applications, grade the applications according to the criticity, and allocate spectrum for it. One of the ideas that I keep hearing is, oh, let's divide the spectrum between, between the users. This is highly inefficient, people. The spectrum should be accessed by all the users, so when one is using more, the other is using less, and so on, this is the best way to use spectrum efficiently. What has to be done, yes, is the priority per type of application. So if you, your application is not a very important, it can be bumped for a license spectrum. Or if it is very important, okay, uh, it will get a priority allocation, and so on. So. This shows how complex is the design, a proper design, of the full apron visibility. So this is a little bit technical, I must agree, but it has to be considered. And this is something that we measured the, the propagation in the airport, in the Logan Airport. Uh, we also did measurements in other airports, uh, I think in Chicago and uh, Dallas. And uh, we analyze, you know, the characteristics of the propagation and so on. So there are graphs that allow us to analyze which kind of modulation can be used uh, the, uh, for different uh, types of terrain and what is the throughput. Uh, we are very conservative in terms of throughput. When we say throughput is the real throughput, is the good put, okay? Because you can have... Uh, numbers of throughput that are fantastic, but in practice they don't happen. So we really uh, don't just use the throughput as a metric. We use the good put, that is the amount of throughput that can really be used. Uh, so these graphs are very, very important. Next one. So you can see that an airport, uh, this is again Logan, Boston, has different areas that are uh, need different approaches, different, different uh, concerns, and so on. All the perimeter has to be monitored, has, has to be sur surveyed. Uh, all the, you know, wildlife, everything, and all of this requires communications. Some communications like uh, uh, Aeromax, some uh, even a license. But it has to be designed as a whole. So what we did, we did here a very uh, quick design for the Logan Airport, and we calculated, you know, uh, you, you can see here how many gates they are, how many satellites, uh, and so on, what is the extent uh, of the runways, uh, how many operations, and we calculated that the, we need about 320 cameras and 750 video feeds to have a complete apron visibility. And then we applied the uh, base stations for each technology, for sensors, for Wi-Fi, for Bluetooth, for public safety, for Aeromax, and so on and so on. So it's really uh, something that uh, has to cover the entire airport. Is uh, People will say, oh, it's a lot of base stations. Well, yes, it's a lot of base stations, but the amount of money that will be saved, uh, the improvement, improvement in the operation, operations of the airport, and the safety of the airport is humongous. So it is worthwhile, and it doesn't need to be done all at the time. The planning, yes, should be done once, and then uh, over time and over the years, you can keep adding. But if you don't do the plan, you cannot add. 
because the things are in the wrong places, we're using the wrong frequencies, doing the wrong things. So it's, again, stressing is very, very important uh, to do a full apron visibility design. So the last slide, finally, conclusions. Well, what are the benefits? It will be much more efficient to operate the airport. Flight delays will be reduced significantly. You know, just a, a, a lightning storm can stop the airport for one, two hours. Just this game is a humongous. Uh, it can optimize capex because you do not need to redeploy or scrap previous installations. It will reduce the opex in the airport. People will know where things are, what to do with them, and so on. People can find people even where they are in the airport. It will increase security. It will increase plane safety. It will improve asset management. And it can be fully implemented over several years. So this is the message that I, I, I was planning to, to give, that, yes, it's very important. We have this spectrum. We have what we need. But we need to understand that this has to be done uh, a global plan, and it can be done for some airports and then replicated in other ones. That one, that's it. Thank you, Leonard. I think uh, you have really taken a, a significant application, and you've kind of exploded, if you will, kind of all the technical and the skills, right? All the sort of technical thinking behind if you do this right and support this one application. You've got all sorts of benefits in terms of operational improvements, et cetera. Um, kind of what that looks like in terms of how you use the spectrum, kind of a mix of technologies, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting point is that if I look at, you know, 40, 50, 60 airports around the world already that have Aramax in some, some shape, fashion, or form, uh, kind of IP camera, CCTV, video support, as an application is present in almost everything. So I think you're on to something. It's certainly in terms of identifying that application set. So I uh, thank you very, very much, Leonard. I think it was, that was super, very valuable presentation. Um, so I want to move to PowerTech. And uh, Gene uh, is a longtime uh, kind of colleague, technologist, and has really uh, become sort of one of the world's leading experts in terms of what the certification of the, you know, of, of, of manufacturers put that to the standard mean, what does it take? It's a complicated, difficult process. Uh, and Gene, I think his presentation today goes a long way to kind of explaining the value of it, why we're spending all this effort. So, because uh, we think it's very important for the user. Um, so Gene, without any further ado, I'll pass it to you. This is the time left to deliver your presentation. Thanks very much, Stefan. Um, yeah, um, Stefan said actually we've, um, had a long history with, um, WiMAX and Tartex been involved in WiMAX and WiGrid, which was, um, WiMAX for the, um, triple infrastructure. So the, it was, it was kind of a logical step actually that we would start to, uh, look towards doing certification for Aramax certification which was, you know, for the aeronautical industry, lots of similarities with um, our own business in terms of, you know, utilities, you know, it's an essential service, it um, looks for security, it looks for all, all the sort of reliability, all the sort of different things actually that utilities have and that lots of commonality with the aeronautical industry. So just a bit of background. Um, so this was the sort of typical... Um, mobile WiMAX certification sort of structure, you know, you're a mobile station, you're a base station that would have a, an ASN, a service node network, and then you would have some sort of channel mod, you'd do measurements, you'd have triple A's. And WiMAX Forum took, um, essentially, ESA 2.16, developed a system profile, which became the WiMAX Forum mobile certification. And they did a series of tests, actually. So for the radio conformance testing, they had 91 for protocol, which was the MAC and the, um, the messaging layer. They had about 515 tests. And then for the interoperability. And the interoperability tests were, were quite extensive in terms of ensuring that 
a number of uh, mobile stations to be able to interoperate with a number of base stations. So this is quite key, actually, because it was um, considered that you, know, you would have mobile devices that would wander from one network to the other. The requirements um, were, you know, were in a document called the Certification Requirement Status List, and this defined the test based on the, the, the specific profile. And the other thing which is common throughout the, the industry, whether it be, you know, LTE, you know, Wi-Fi, um, 4G, was, was the concept of the protocol implementation conformance statement. And this, this listed, um, based on the, the system profile, listed the various requirements for a system uh, to meet the particular profile. And it would talk about things like maybe you know, the bandwidth, maybe talk about the type of messaging that would have to go on, all the sort of things that were derived out of the 2.16 standard or the CGPT standard that were maybe form, would form part of the profile. So looking at the Aramax application, so um, our and myself actually is the sort of WiMAX certification body, and as Declan said, actually, that we're the... the the only lab today, actually, that's got um, WiMAX certification, you know, ability uh, in terms of um, with, with the qualifications, qualifications that we've got, and we've for Aramax actually, the, the the profile was was looked at in terms of you know efficiency, what things could we do better, so the RCT or the video conformance test was reduced down to. 15 tests for the base station and 18 for the mobile station, and these were these were tests to to still verify actually that it met the requirements and of the the Aramax, um, profile. And as I said, actually down at the bottom of the slide, there was an Aramax minimum operation performance, and there was also an Aramax standard of recommended practices that were agreed jointly with the industry. Um, you know, uh, between a uh, combination of IKEO, um, I think, um, so there was WiMAX forum actually, there was these discussions to sort of make sure that the profiles met the requirements for the aeronautical industry. Uh, same with the protocol conformance testing. That was reduced um, down again to some efficiencies actually down to 71 tests for the base station and 55 for the mobile station. Um, the interoperability again actually that was looked at and we've got a series of um, different tests for both the base station and the mobile station um, to make sure that they meet the requirement. And the idea is actually that a company could do, could, could, could come back, could do one of these tests, like so do one of the test suites actually and you know sort of work the way through it etc. So it would eventually if you, if you pass all of the tests then you would, you know, you would get WiMAX certification or AMAX certification. And as Declan mentioned, uh, Siemens had a major milestone and they managed to sort of complete all three of the test suites. So this is the um, prerequisite. So this is, this is the most important thing because one of the things actually is that to do the tests and to, to really have them done efficiently, uh, there's, there's lots of requirements actually that the, um, the than manufacturers could do to sort of help. Um, we, we do stress a lot actually that the, the vendors coming forward actually should um, complete the picks, go right through the document, make sure that they've, they've covered all the various elements. Um, this, one of the second documents is, is what we call the picks-it. And this is a, a lab document, if you like. And what it is is it basically goes through the detail of the equipment that's been certified um, we, we asked for, you know, during the course of the certification, we had to do lots of, of things to the product in terms of to create different conditions and to look for different messages and things which maybe don't normally happen in practice, but however might happen in one particular condition. And so we do need quite a lot of information uh, on the equipment to be able to sort of test it fully um, against the RCT and the PCT. And the other thing to note is that we, we do this strictly with 
under an NDA with the company that's coming forward to um, to do the certification to ensure that there's a sort of a wall between the information you provide and, and you know the information provided is not made public. Um, the other thing which we, we do stress a lot is is a pretest to make sure that um, for the um, the RCT and the PCT that. Um, the, the first time that you go through the test is not in the lab. You know, that's it's really. I think you should carry out all of the tests. But really, I think it makes good sense actually to go through the majority of the tests. or certainly a sample of it. We we've offered this as a sort of service in the past to try and sort of, you know, go through roughly you know a number of the tests, etc., to sort of highlight issues to um, a manufacturer because. One of the things actually we, we do want to do is that when we go through the six sets of tests actually from the RCT, PCT and IoT that we want to maintain as much as possible the same software version or else if there is a need to change um, through one set of tests to the other actually that they're still documented so that we don't have to unnecessarily go back and repeat any tests. So that's, that's you know, that, you see that's the key thing to do. On the radio conformance tests, so um talked about them earlier actually. So the the types of tests actually which we do for the likes of the, the, the RCT, um, you're looking at things like transmit level, receiver sensitivity, the, the RF quality, the HR EJRQ performance, everything to do with the sort of RF and what's termed the spy level. And and the tests are conformance based, so we have a, a, a specific limit. Uh, so we don't measure the performance. Uh, but what we do is we say, okay, if there's a particular level, then we, we say, okay, if, if it's above that level, it passes, if it's above the, if, you know, if it, below it, it fails. And we have, we obviously within the lab, actually, we've got a measurement and certainty against all the various tests which are carried out. The, again, actually, the RCT uses the PICs, and it's based on the, the memory operating performance specification. All of the tests, um, which we have is our, um, uh, the, 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 as I say, they're covered under the, the radio frequency aspects of interoperability, and they're all related back to 82.16, 2009. Um, where the sort of future versions of it, the one which we standardized and we decided that there wasn't too many differences between 2009, 2012, actually, it was 2009. Um, Pertex, uh certified for the WAMAX forum, and we, we're also certified to do the uh, RCT tests under ISO 17025, so this is a external qualification for the lab actually to carry out these tests, and I, I believe that makes us quite unique. Uh, regarding the equipment, um, we need two samples of the product to test, and, and uh, there's two reasons for this actually. One is, if we, if for one reason, actually, one of the test samples fails, it means that we've got another one which we can rely on. We're not looking, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, make sure that we can pass the product based on, um, you know, the, the, the performance of, the, you know, the, the ability of the product rather than if there's a, a fault or a problem with the, the, um, the, the product itself. The other item is that some of the tests require two samples, like some of the handover tests. So it's, it, it makes it more, you know, uh, expedient actually to have two samples of the product. Next one is the um, uh, protocol conformance test, and uh, again, this is this is this looks at the sort of um, the the mark layer of the uh, of the product. Again, it's it's again it's a conformance based, but it. It tends to look at the the, the correctness of the, exist, the existence of a message, a particular MAC message. So when the um, uh, when the, the product is is um, say if a mobile station has been switched on, it does network entry to make sure that the correct sequence of messages are passed between the, the mobile station and the base station. Um, Based on what's required in the, in the standard and in the picks and in the system profile, and uh, it's quite key actually to make sure that you know the, the messages and that it, it sort of follows on actually from the interoperability, you know, the interoperability test that you know, the correct messages pass between the, the device, and it, 
the device handles the messages in the correct way. So there's, there's quite a number of tests, as I said before, actually. There's, there's around about you know, 71 tests in base station device for the mobile station to, to look at the various different uh, messages. Again, we've got um, 17025 um, from an external body, actually. Um, so to to, um, to to certify that we're doing these tests correctly and that we're meeting, you know, we're, we're going through the document in the correct way and, and recording the, the information. Uh, again, I've mentioned here actually about having two samples of the test product. The other thing is that for the protocol test, if, um, if it's a base station which has been um, qualified, then um, within the forum, actually, we've made a decision, actually, that uh, the, the authentication, there wasn't authentication required for the RCT test, but there is authentication required for the protocol conformance test. But it can be with self-signed certificates, so it doesn't have to have an external route. However, we do need the, the, um, the vendor to supply their, their own AAA appliance, unless it's one that's commonly available or one which we may have in the lab. And also, if there's an access, access service node required, some base stations have this sort of integrated. Other base stations, they have this separate. So um, that would need to be supplied by the um, by the vendor who's bringing their base station into their um, uh, certification. Final test. So the idea is that, that um, either you know, once you've gone through both the RCT and the PCT the product, then um, what we would do is we do a series of tests either on the, the base station or the mobile station to verify that it interoperated with uh, some, uh, another vendor's equipment that had also been through the RCT and the PCT. And, and this, is, this is probably the probably one of the most important tests. I mean, the, the RCT and the PCT are, are, are leading up to this, actually, but the key thing for Linux or Linux is interoperability. And the key thing, actually, from a, um, a, an airport's perspective or an a, 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 a end user perspective is actually is that the base station is compatible not just with um, the mobile stations from the same um, supplier, but also from uh, other suppliers as well, uh, since you don't necessarily have control over that. So the IoT test is we always make sure that we carry out the different vendor. Again, it's conformance test. Um, there's lots of similarities in the test, actually, that we do between the RCT and the PCT because essentially what you're doing is that you're verifying, actually, that, that some of the tests which we carried out under the RCT and the PCT, you can indeed uh, carry out these tests, actually, with uh, another vendor's equipment. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's very, very similar, actually. Lots of the tests are very similar. We're um, still going through the process right now of getting certification to 17025. Uh, we hope to have this by the end of this year. And again, actually, it's, it's the, the suppliers responsible to provide two samples of the product. We also have the criteria after the, the interoperability tests have been done that the equipment remains in the lab for one to two years. And the reason for this is, is, is if there's any issue with the interoperability of the, the system, that we've got a reference system that we can go back and say, okay, this was the particular test that we carried out. So it's, it's kind of insurance for the end user um, that if they do have an, uh, some any sort of problem or issue with interoperability, then there's a reference system that they can go back and look at. Okay, so thanks very much. Thank you, Gene. I think um, what's clear in hearing you describe, you know, RCT, PCT, and the IoT is that this is a, a complicated, thorough, kind of heavy lift of a process. I mean, it, I know I know the ecosystem has spent a lot of time trying to make it as efficient as possible. And I think it is vastly more efficient than, you know, when we first put sort of pen to paper two, two plus years ago to sort of devise this. But it's also a very serious process, and I think um, that's evidenced by the care that you, that your organization, the ecosystem, has taken in developing. But also, if you look at the efforts that manufacturers are making to secure certification, it's, it's not simple, it's not easy, and it's uh, which is appropriate because it's meaningful. That's the conclusion of it. So I think you know, we 
have a very the, the the user community should have great trust that uh, if a manufacturer shows up with a you know a certificate of compliance to the standard as verified by PowerTech, it's a meaningful you know there's there's a lot of, there's a lot behind that. So uh, thanks to you, the, the patience of your organization, but also the thoroughness of your organization as you develop these processes. And the patience of dealing with a lot of manufacturers who over many months are struggling sometimes to complete tests and then all that. So I think it's, it's been a pretty smooth process. Um, so that's the, that's, that's the presentations for today. I think it was, it was very, very, very technical today, but it's important to hear from Leonard on the RS side because that's the system that the, the spectrum as an asset is sort of such a differentiating uh, capability, Aramax systems and technologies, and I think Leonard did a fantastic job sort of underscore the value of that spectrum. And then for Gene to take the time that he did to describe our certification program, I think was very, very helpful. And as you can see, we, uh, we started out timidly way back in 2009 at Cleveland, uh, the Glenn Research Center with NASA, but now we're at uh, over 50 airports, and we're really expanding and accelerating kind of algorithmic, if you will, the, uh, the uh, number of deployments worldwide. And that, you know, COVID obviously has put a hiccup in everybody's plans, but I think uh, we would expect uh, the post-pandemic to kind of continue to see the resurgence of, of uh, deployments around the world. Uh, and again, so these, these presentations are certainly available um, on the website. Uh, very, very happy to have done them. Again, thanks to Gene and Leonard today for, and, uh, for their presentations and their effort and uh, all the prior uh, presenters. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, on this channel in two weeks for the next uh, series of presentations.